wait till it goes off green. And it'll give you an anchor rate, so that's cool.
for resident and school building. Is there a difference? Well, we're, I was on the plane. It's time to start. Thank you all for being here. I think it was 28 outside. Not too bad. Uh, it's the wind that gets you, though. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John chapter 1. That's where we're going to begin this morning. John chapter 1. We're going to be studying the baptism of Jesus. Before we get into our lesson, does anyone have any updates for our uh, prayer requests? Yes, Cleo. Oh, wow. Okay. You said your nephew. Price, like the price is right. Okay. So they were they're missionaries over in Kiev, uh, Ukraine. Lived there fifteen years and they've they've been exiled for the moment. And they're having a lot of a lot of issues over there, so certainly want to remember 
uh, the people of Ukraine. We, we hear from Jerry Max Morgan a lot about the, the difficulties of the orphanages there, and um, it's just a hard, hard place to live. Uh, Janie, did you have something? Donald Willie W I L L I E. Okay. He's, he's just like my brother, but but uh, she's been having some problems. All right. So Donald Willie having health problems in nursing home in Dexter. And then we got the media got everything set for him. Tuesday he has a heart scan, and Wednesday he has a bone marrow in the fourth, and the thirty-first he'll start. Okay, so Carl will start chemo on the 31st and has, uh, so that's a Monday, uh, a week from Monday, yes. uh, but in the week between he's got some yeah. uh, doctor's appointments, time. so. Let me give you a little update. I think some already know that Beverly's mom moved in with Beverly's sister, Pauletta, and that's working out really well. Uh, All right. So that's uh, Miss Wheeler, Bev's uh, mother. It seems like she's doing better. I'm, I'm guessing they're just she's just taking medication to kind of relieve the congestive heart failure and. Right. right now, she's in a good, seems like a good place. So, good. Great to hear. Anything else? All right, let's go ahead and pray then. Dear God, most high, our Father who is in heaven, you are holy, you are righteous. You are just, you are loving, you are compassionate, you are slow to anger. Thank you, Lord, for being you and being the God that we need. And we pray that we can be humble servants before you, our King, that in all that we do and say that we will show that we love you and we respect your authority and we care about what you care about. And this morning as we assemble, tonight as we assemble, we pray that this whole day will be a day that we can praise you for who you are and what you've done in our lives, and what you will do for us, especially in eternity. And we're thankful for the, the price that was paid in Jesus' blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We're thankful, Lord, that we have a hope of eternity with you, and we pray each day that we will long for that eternity, that we won't love the world or the things of this world, but we will love you and you alone. We will love the hope that you give us through Jesus. Help us, Lord, to celebrate that today, to remember what it cost, and when necessary, to repent of the sins that we've done against you. We pray, Lord, that you will bless our Bible hour tonight, uh, today, in this hour. That you'll help us as we look into your word, and that we'll do so more deeply. That we will always reflect on what you have put before us uh, through your holy word. We know, Lord, we are blessed to know your will for us through the scriptures. Help us always to be people who cling to the scripture and and to receive it with a, a pure and honest heart. We pray, Lord, that you will be with those who are sick and who are hurting. We know there are so many in our world that are struggling with illness right now. We pray that you will alleviate suffering in all of those instances according to your will. We pray for the people who are dear to our heart that we have on our prayer list. Uh, we especially want to remember Carl and his chemo treatment that will start here soon. Uh, we pray you'll be with him and Janie as they face this together and face it with, even with us as, as brothers.
brothers and sisters in Christ that will continue to lean on you and trust in you and that you will work through your providence and through your care and through answering our prayers to overcome this cancer. We pray, Lord, that you will be with Marveline. Help her, Lord, as she heals. We pray, Lord, that she will not fall anymore, that she won't have uh, any more difficulties uh, like she has had, and, and that she'll regain her strength soon. We pray for Pauletta Burns. We know that she's had a lot of appointments this past week, and we pray all of those uh, went well, and we pray that you'll continue to help her as she faces uh, cancer of the lungs and cancer of the breast, and we pray that they'll find some way to pull her through. We pray for Bev's mom, and we're thankful she is doing uh, better, and she's in a good place uh, with Pauletta down there in Paragould. Uh, help them through this time. We pray for George Holland, who's been sick recently. I know that Vicki Holland was sick as well this morning. Uh, be with her. We pray for Daryl Halvey, uh, Vicki Plum's cousin, uh, as he deals with the aftermath of COVID. We pray for Ron Kimball's daughter. She's going through tr uh, chemo treatment. We pray for Lou Ellen as she faces shingles. We pray for Janie's cousin, Donald Willie, and his health problems. And finally, we want to pray for Brandon and Katie Price as they are facing a lot of change and turmoil in that part of the world. They've been trying to, to serve you and to reach people uh, through the gospel, uh, but because of the political situation over there, had to leave. And we pray, Lord, that you'll be with the people of Ukraine as they have left. We pray for peace over there. We pray, Lord, for an open door for the gospel. But be with Brandon and Katie as they wait. Keep them safe and help them, Lord, to trust in you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. We know it's through Jesus that we're able to pray, for you, pray to you wherever we are, when, whenever we want, and to ask you to help us through this life. And we pray, Lord, that we will live a life of prayer, that we will lean on you each day and trust that you will see us through. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, John chapter 1 is where we're going to begin. John chapter 1. Now, all three gospel accounts record the baptism of Jesus, and we're going to read, um, we're going to read John's first, and we'll comment on a few things, um, and then eventually move over to, to Matthew. Before we get into this, what, what age, about what age was Jesus when he was baptized and really began his ministry? Yes, he was around 30 years of age. What's the significance of 30? Okay, so so maybe there's some, um, you know, people give a little bit more credence to you because you're now 30 versus being in your 20s. Maybe there's some something to do with that. Any other thoughts? I think when you're 30, you're more learned. You're more learned once you're 30? Okay, so you've, you've had some time to think and consider and study different subjects. Can you think of anyone in the Bible that was 30 when he started something? I was wondering if anyone would come up with this, but there's actually a couple of occasions when we see 30 as being significant as the beginning of uh, some type of ministry or reign. One would be David. David was 30 when he began to reign as king, so that's pretty cool. That's 2 Samuel 5 and verse 4. Joseph of the book of Genesis, he was 30 when he began his uh, public career in service to Pharaoh. Genesis 41 and verse 16, uh, 46, 41 and 46. Um, Ezekiel, he was called into ministry at the age of 30. Now, what was Ezekiel's background? 
If he had stayed in Jerusalem, what would he have been? He would have been a priest, okay? And according to Numbers 4 and verse 3, the ages between 30 and 50 was when someone could serve as a priest. So some people think he was called um, at that time. It's kind of a signal to say, you're not going to be a priest in the temple, but you're going to be a priest, uh, the go-between between me and my people in exile. So there's some significance with the age of 30 throughout the Bible. Also, in the first century... Um, mindset among the Jewish people, 30 was kind of seen as that, that state, as kind of was said before, where it was a transition from being a child to being more of an adult. Uh, I found this in the Mishnah. I didn't find this, but I found it online where someone had found it in the Mishnah. And a Mishnah was just a, a Greek, uh, not a Greek, a Jewish writing that kind of explains some of the old law. And it says there that, um, that at age five years old, the child is fit for the Scripture. In other words, he needs to be start learning the Scripture at the age of five. At ten years, the Mishnah, which was the oral Torah and interpretation, so you start learning at age ten some of the things that people say about the Bible. At age 13, for the fulfilling of commandments, and so that would be, Maybe close to what we consider like the age of accountability. They're kind of expected at that point to start fulfilling the commandments. Um, that would also be the time of the bar mitzvah. Uh, actually, that would be 12, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay, uh, at age 15, the Talmud. So that was the rabbinic interpretations. Uh, and they would start making some rabbinic interpretations at that point. At uh, age 18, the bride chamber. And so that would be when he would get married. At 20, pursuing a vocation. We see with Jesus that he pursued the vocation that his father had, being a carpenter. And then finally, at 30, for authority slash strength, and most people interpret that as the ability to teach others. And so it's very likely if Jesus had started his ministry before the age of 30, that this first century audience would not have perceived him as authoritative enough to be a rabbi. And uh, we're thinking, man, 30 years, that's a long time to wait for Jesus to, to begin his ministry. But that was what was needed for him to have the correct impact through his ministry, uh, to be able to preach the gospel and to have people actually to listen. So uh, just a little bit of background when you think about Jesus being the age of 30 when he started his ministry. Now let's dive in John chapter 1. We're going to start in um, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. It says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, what, did Jesus, uh, what did John mean by that? Calling Jesus the Lamb of God. Right, so it was he was going to be the sacrifice for all the people through his perfect life, just as in the old covenant they would offer a lamb to take away sins without blemish. Absolutely, we'll talk about that in the sermon a little bit, and that um, the fact that he called him this views him as really the new Passover lamb that would take away the sins of the people. All right, uh, verse thirty. This is he who of whom I said, "After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel." What's John saying in this? These two verses here. Right. So the, the reason that John came was to reveal Jesus and to reveal him to Israel for people to know that he is, he is the Messiah. Okay. What's, what's this mean when he says, he, uh, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Now, who was born for, first, John or Jesus? John. So how can he say that Jesus was before him. 
He's saying that Jesus was eternal, right? So Jesus pre-existed his, his uh, incarnation, his earthly manifestation. Uh, he, as John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, that he was with God and was God. And so Jesus, here he's acknowledging that Jesus pre-existed before he came into this world. Then verse 32, And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So here John is rehashing Jesus' baptism, and he says when, when Jesus came out of the water, what happened? Okay, was it an actual dove? Okay, it says like a dove, okay. So um, you know, there are a lot of pictures online when you type in the Holy Spirit, and it's, it's an actual dove that they, they will personify. And I don't know how it looked, but it does say like a dove. It doesn't have to be a literal dove. But he came and rested upon Jesus. And, and what did that signify to John? That he was the Messiah, and this is the one that, that God sent him to prepare the way for, right? And so uh, God had told John beforehand, hey, there's going to be someone that you're going to see the Spirit descend upon. And, and when you do that, you'll know that's the person who, is, who you're preparing the way for. That is the Messiah. That is the one who, is, uh, who ranks before you. Now, this is an interesting question that, that came up in, in the commentaries is, do you think that Jesus and John had met before this point? Right. So uh, there was a 30-year opportunity. Now, there was some time when, when they went off to Egypt and had to come back, but still there had been maybe some opportunity there. Do you think they met? Does Jesus saying you know, that he did not know him, does that necessitate him not knowing him personally? You think so? Okay. Mm-hmm. John had to be living in another region, or John would have been killed. Correct. Right. Uh, so he wouldn't have been in, in Bethlehem. They probably didn't see each other. No, I don't know that. Yeah. It's an interesting to think about. I don't know if we can get a, uh, some confirmation, but you almost uh, wonder what Elizabeth would have told John about Jesus. You know, because certainly Elizabeth had a, a lot of. Uh, revelation given to her, uh, especially John leaping in her own womb to indicate that Jesus was uh, the Messiah. Um, any more thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, maybe he didn't know him, but it's interesting to me to think about him saying, behold the Lamb of God, when he's coming down for the baptism. You know? Huh. Any more thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, when they had peace, the, Jew, the Jewish people had peace throughout mm-hmm. the year, and people would come and travel long distances for the peace. Well, kids would play with kids. Right. Around. Yeah, yeah, they would have been in Jerusalem for many years. I mean, every um, every male uh, was expected to go to Jerusalem for the three prominent feasts uh, of Feast of Booths, um, Passover, and the Feast of Weeks, I believe. Okay. Messiah, and he's 
said, I didn't know that before I baptized him. Okay. Paraphrasing. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really good to think about. Maybe saying, I, don't, I did not know him was more, I did not know that he was the Messiah, but now I do. Um, it still is interesting, though, and maybe, maybe this is, um, I don't know. Let me know what you think about this. Verse 29 said that, that Jesus was coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. So it seems like there is, maybe even before the baptism, he has some revelation and maybe it's just something that God just gives him right there on the spot. Um, but he certainly, when he approached him, viewed him as the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Bethany, you have something? It's very good thoughts. I, I think I'm probably more, more confused as ever, so thank you guys. <laughs> Clear as mud. Well, it looks like... Possibly. That's a good thought. I've always thought of it opposite, like he was coming to him to be baptized and he said that. So maybe he's just speaking in past tense here. Oh, you do? Okay. Okay. I'd always thought it the opposite, but um, it does make sense based upon the past tense that's being used. Go back to the other Gospels, I think, to lead up to that. Okay, well, we will in just a second. So, uh, any more thoughts on that before we move on to uh, Matthew? Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Hey. Well, there's a good chance because there were uh, the festivals in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the families being devout Jews. Right. Yeah, and I think Shirley said it, it's really immaterial to the, the forte of this. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think about. But I, for me, it actually helped with the chronology of it all. So that's, that's noteworthy to kind of think about how it all played out and, and when, when he received such a revelation and, and what made him think that and say that. So uh, very good. Very good. All right, let's go back to Matthew 3. Matthew 3, starting in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need, you, need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? All right, so what, what, what is John doing here? Right, right. It kind of reminds me of uh, the situation in John 13 when Jesus starts washing his disciples' feet, and you're just like, no, 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 I uh, let me do it. Th this is my task to do. And then he says, no, if if you don't let me do this, and you have no portion with me, and he's like, 
wash me all over, wash my whole body, right? And, uh, and I think that's important for us to see the humility of John, humility of Peter, um, and... Yeah. Yeah, John is is the great example for us to always be pointing to Jesus. Um, it's easy for us, and, and we'll talk about this later on. I've been working on a lesson about being the light of the world and the salt of the earth and what that means. And I think a big part of that is that we don't just do good things for other people, but we do good deeds and we point to our Heavenly Father. We point to Jesus. We say, I'm not doing this because I'm extra good. I'm doing it because of my faith, because he has taught me to be generous. He has taught me to be kind and loving and so forth. So, um, Adam, I think yeah. that verse is another piece of that conversation we were just having. Okay. Was, did John know for sure 100% who Jesus was before the death of the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. Because here, like Jenna says, it kind of leads us to believe that he did because he resisted doing the baptizing. Right. Right. And maybe he had an idea about it, um, and then the Spirit descending confirmed that. And then we find in Matthew 13, there's a situation where John ends up in prison, and he sends his disciples to Jesus, and what do they ask him? Are you the one, or should we send, you know, look for someone else? Um, we all have doubts, don't we? I mean, um, you know, Jesus really shows how how John was, you know, of of women, of woman. He, you know, no one greater has been born. I mean, he's um, he's certainly uh, someone revered in Scripture. But even he had doubts. You know, he uh, had he had confirmation and further confirmation. But sometimes it just takes us to put it all together, and it's hard sometimes to do that. All right, so he's preventing him from being baptized. I don't need to baptize you, but you need to baptize to baptize me. Verse 15, and Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, talking about John, consented. All right, so here, um, why was Jesus not baptized? For sin. For sin, right? Um, the baptism of John was a baptism of repentance. of repentance, which has the idea that you have have sinned. Okay, and so Jesus is not being baptized because he had done something wrong. What was the purpose of Jesus's baptism? Okay, to fulfill all righteousness. That is what, um, what Jesus answers. What does it mean to fulfill? John was going to require baptism, and he was going to fulfill the law of righteousness is to follow the commands of God. Okay, uh, so, but, but let's, let's focus on the first part of that. Let's f- focus on fulfill. What does it mean to fulfill? To complete, to follow through. In in especially in the book of Matthew, what does fulfillment have to do with usually? Okay, fulfilling the law, so fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures, right? And Jesus will say, the whole Old Testament was pointing to me, right? So uh, Jesus was. Uh, where the Old Testament was heading the whole time. Okay? So, here, fulfill, to bring to completion all righteousness. What does righteousness mean? Goodness. Okay, that, I think that's part of righteousness. The Bible says God's commandments are righteous. Okay, so God's commandments are righteous. Righteous. 
Okay. Okay, so doing what God wants us to do. Okay. I've, already, I've always used with the word righteousness, the way to describe it is right in the sight of God. Okay. Okay, he credits us with righteousness. So it's a gift, right, that he gives to us. But it's a gift after what? Obedience. Uh, and we, we see this in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is commanding them to live righteously. So live... It's attacking me here. Uh, live in a righteous manner. Live in a right way in the sight of God. And when you do so, God will give you his righteousness. He will credit it to us. All right? So, what does it mean to fulfill all righteousness? All right, to complete it. Okay, do the, say that one more time. Do all that you need to do to be obedient to him. All right. How is Jesus doing that here? Okay. He's fulfilling the prophecy. What, what prophecy is he fulfilling? Well, God. I mean, I mean this, this was supposed to happen, in other words. It's been prophesied that Jesus would do all this. Okay. It was prophesied that Jesus would do this. And we see that specifically with John, right? Right. That... Uh, the person you see the Spirit descend upon, that this is fulfilling it. And, and constantly throughout John's teaching is he's preparing the way for someone greater, right? Someone he's not even worthy to untie his sandals, which was something that only, uh, it was like a menial job for a slave. And he says, I can't even do that compared to Jesus. So Jesus, in a sense, is being the fulfillment of John's ministry, Okay. And by being baptized, what is Jesus saying about John? Right. John had been talking about the rock for Christ. Yeah. So uh, it's essentially confirming his ministry and saying it's valid. Is that kind of what y'all were saying? I'm just getting a little, uh, some, uh, what do you call it? Just, um, whatever. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm got a little chills just thinking about that, how he was willing, I, I don't know how to speak about my feelings, I'm a guy, so anyway, uh, just got some chills just thinking about how he was just willing to be that example and just submit, to submit to God's plan. Right, right. And I, I, that's a great example to us in submitting to God's plan in our own lives. And, um, and I'm sure it took a lot of um, humility for Jesus to do this, uh, to be baptized by someone else. But he was willing to do it. Whatever God's plan had for him, he was willing to do. And um, any more thoughts? I'm 
sure been made fun of, you know, and then to see the one you've been preaching about all that time must have been just unbelievably amazing to see. And then when you think about Jesus' obedience, I mean, he didn't have to do that. But he did what, he, what God knew, what he knew God wanted him to do. And I know I've shared this before. I know I have, but I'll say it again. But that's, that's what brought me to Jesus, was knowing that if it was good enough for him, who is the creator of everything, I am going to be baptized too. And I know I've said that before, but it, it just, when other things don't make sense, that does, that, that moment right there of obedience, hmm. that makes sense. That's great. Thank you for sharing. So here Jesus is submissive to God's plan. And really, if you think about baptism, what does baptism represent? Now, I know it does more than just represent something. It's more than a symbol. But what does it represent? So, yeah, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, right? We join him. We die to sin. We're buried in baptism. We rise to newness of life, Romans chapter 6. And so, and in some sense, Jesus being baptized is somewhat a, a forecast of what's going to happen to him. At that, at that point, you're pure. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, the point of baptism is that dividing line from, from lost in sin to saved before God and having your sins washed away. Uh, old creation, new creation, uh, there, there's a lot of different images that the Bible uses to show, yeah, that is the point of salvation. Yeah, go ahead, Bethany. Okay. Put me on the spotlight, don't you? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think there's something going on there with that as well. It wasn't just kings, right? Who, who else was anointed in the Old Testament? David was anointed. He's a king. What other positions were anointed? Priests were. Any other? Prophets, there you go. I mean, just throw out some positions in the Old Testament, you probably land on it. Um, now, we see, we see that, you know, David would be an example of a king. Priests would be Aaron and his sons uh, being anointed by Moses. Um, Elisha was anointed by Elijah. Uh, and so we, we see that in the Old Testament. And that was really a part where uh, it was said that the Spirit came upon them. That was kind of the start of that. And, and you see that even with David once he is king and he's, he's messed up big time in Psalm 51. He says, take not your spirit from me. Now, I think Jesus had the spirit his whole life, but maybe there's a, um, especially with the descent of the dove, maybe there's a, a special um, a focus at this point, especially maybe an extra power given to him to, to make miracles and so forth uh, that was given to him at this point. It says he was led by the Spirit. Right. And so there might be different portions of the Spirit. And in fact, if you think about Elisha, his prayer to God was, give me a double portion. Maybe he was to Elijah for God, but eventually a double portion. And what happened to Elisha? This is a good, good trivia. Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah. Isn't that cool? You know, he says, give me the old portion of the Spirit, and he had you know, double the manifestation of the Spirit before in the Bible, at least. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's really cool to think about as well. But yeah, with this anointing um, of a new role, a new ministry, whether it's a king, a prophet, or a priest, they would anoint them with, with fluid, liquid, right? And the Spirit was said to be upon them at that point. And, and Jesus said that in Luke chapter 4. You remember when 
being anointed in Luke chapter 4. And he sat down, and what did he say? This prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. So he he was taking on that designation as the anointed one, which so, just so happens to be the word for Christ. That word Christ means anointed one. That is anointed for a purpose, for a ministry, if you will. But just what you had just said uh, a minute ago, Luke's version of the after baptism into the world, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. So there's something else there. Good, good, yeah. I, you know, Luke talks a lot more about the Holy Spirit than, than the other Gospels. And so that that's pretty significant to say that he was filled by the Spirit and also led by the Spirit as well. Um, keep your finger there in Matthew and go to Acts. starting verse 37, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. It seems like the baptism of John is kind of combined with, with Jesus' anointing with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And it further talks about his death. So, yeah, there's, I think there's that combination there. There's this anointing of, um, through the baptism, as well as the giving of the Holy Spirit, as well. And it's also a foretaste of who Jesus was, right? He's the king of kings. He's the prophet. I remember reading there in, in Deuteronomy 18 about how, how Moses prophesied about a prophet to come. Just listen to him. Listen to this prophet that's going to come. All the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, listen to that prophet. And he was a prophet. He was a great prophet. And then he was, he's our great high priest. Right? He goes between us and God and offers a sacrifice of himself for our sins. Let's go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 3. Uh, verse 16, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. By the way, the word baptism means immersion. And we see a lot of different words in the New Testament that show that this is full immersion. This is all the way under the water. It says he went up from the water. Just a little tidbit there. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. What do we see in these last few verses? You mean that God is pleased with his Son? Okay. What about that? Uh, this, this, this voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, and this is my beloved please. I guess he's proud of him. He's proud of him? Yeah. I think there is some of that. I mean, he's been well pleased. For what the life he's lived. Yeah. Yeah. Up to that point, he was proud of, of the path that he was on, and uh, we know where that path would eventually lead. Now, is this the only time that we get this this phrase um, about you know from heaven God saying this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. No. No. The, Mount of Transfiguration. the Mount of Transfiguration, right? That, that happens as well. He, he, and that's just the disciples that hear that, but certainly more people probably have heard it here. Yeah. All right. What else does it say? What else is this passage about? Yeah, 
this is validating uh, validating both John's ministry and Jesus' upcoming ministry. And so, yeah, I mean, if, if you were in the audience that day, um, boy, you would you would say, "Hey, I want to be near that guy." When the heavens were open, to let it be a pretty awesome thing. I mean, I mean, wonder what that was like oh. for the heavens to open. I always just kind of picture clouds separating, but maybe that's not yeah. the only that thing that happened. Okay, so there, there is a uh, sense where God is Father. What else do we see? God is Son, and God as Spirit. So we see what is often called the Trinity. Uh, the New Testament used the word Godhead. Um, and uh, there, there's a lot of people that think that that God is just in different modes. It's called modalism. Like it's just like water being, you know, water can be liquid, it can be a gas, right? Evaporation, everything. And it can be a solid, right? Being ice. And I think that's kind of the different modes of God. But here we see they are three distinct persons. Uh, unless somehow God could like throw his voice up into the heavens, I I think we have three distinct persons here, and we see them all present at the same time. And so that kind of uh, kind of pushes back against that, that teaching. God made the whole world, so the whole, whole world could see that He is God. <laughs> right? Yeah, there's he, revelation. Yeah, that one. Then He sent His Son and His disciples to preach this word. I think John at least saw it too, but uh, because he was able to say, you know, I saw the Spirit descend on him and he was talking to those the people about that. I don't know. Any other thoughts on that? I kind of think that it was more than just him and John. Well, I just, it just caught me when I saw the mother of the sister of Matthew. Well, again, he's telling us what happened, mm -hmm. but it's just like we saw that. Now, Peter for sure says in the, the uh, book of 1 Peter that he saw uh, what he saw on the Mount of, of Transfiguration. So he was led in on that. Um, we're not sure how public, how many people were there or whatever. There was another time when, he, when God spoke and they thought kind of like lightning. So, um, yeah, we're not real sure, but it certainly confirmed to John that Jesus was the Messiah. Thank you all. Appreciate it.
Let me take this opportunity to welcome you if you're visiting with us. Uh, and we'd ask that you'd fill out a visitor's card you'll find on the back of one of the seats. You can put it in the collection plate when it comes around. We'll have a record of your being here. A few announcements before I turn it over to Dennis, who will be our song leader this morning. The fifth Sunday potluck and wedding shower will be uh, next Sunday, the 30th. Uh, we'll have soup and sandwich potluck after the morning service. And then uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. We'll have soup and supper sandwich. We will come back up and meet again. Then after that second meeting, we'll go back downstairs and have the wedding shower. Probably be something else to eat, too. So it'll be a day of worshiping and eating and rejoicing. Anyway, after the second service, we will have a wedding shower, gift shower for Michael and Brooke. So, and they, uh, the registry is in the, uh, is in the bulletin if you'd like to pick up a bulletin. Elders and deacons meeting today at five o'clock. Valentine dinner there's, I, is uh, set for February the 19th at five o'clock. Uh, a few touch-ups on our uh, prayer list. Carl will start his chemotherapy on the 31st, so let's remember him. And uh, Janie's cousin, Donald Willie, is having some health issues. She asked us to remember him. Cleo's nephew, uh, it's the Price family, are in the Ukraine, and she said this morning that uh, they were told they needed to leave. So please keep uh, not only that family, but others in Ukraine in your thoughts and your prayers. Pauletta said that she met with the surgeon uh, this week. The uh, cancer team is going to, or had met with the surgeon this week. The cancer team is going to meet and they are going to discuss the best plan of action to put in place for her. So please remember her in your prayers. Again, thanks for being with us this morning, and I will turn it over to Dennis. Good morning. Happy Sunday. You ready to sing? Three people said yes, so uh, <laughs> it's going to be loud today, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, this is a great old song about our Savior, our Shepherd. I need that uh, back monitor on if somebody could get that. I, that helps me a little bit. All right, let's be standing. I'm going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of this wonderful song. Mm -hmm. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us much we need thy tenderest care in thy pleasant pastures feed us for our use thy folds prepare blessed jesus blessed jesus thou hast bought us thine we are blessed jesus blessed jesus Thou hast bought us, thine we are. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor. Early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with thy love our bosoms fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. We'll sing this song and then Carl will lead us in our first prayer this morning. 
Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us. Blessed Redeemer, living word. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Well, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come and worship thee. Sing songs of praise unto thy name. Coming to thee through the avenue of prayer. Lord, we have several on our prayer list. Ask you be with Donna Willie, one of Janie's cousins, uh, Mrs. Wheeler, Marveline Norton, Pauletta Burns, George Holland, Brandon, when they were in Ukraine. Ukraine had to leave for turmoil over there. Pray, O oh Lord, that the turmoil will go away and that people will be able to hear the word of Christ and speak in his name that others may learn. Go with us in all things. Forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a minute, uh, Alan will lead us as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. And I realize this song has five little verses, and in, in reading through it, I just could not leave one out. It's just one of the more uh, thought-provoking and loving uh, songs about Jesus. And we'll sing that, and then we'll partake of the bread and the cup. Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts, thou fount of life, the light of men, from all the bliss that earth imparts, we turn unfilled to thee again thy truth unchanged hath ever stood thou savest those that on thee call to them that seek thee thou art good to them that find thee all in all. On thee we feed thou living bread and long to feast upon thee still. We drink of thee fountain head whose streams each thirsting soul can fill our restless spirits yearn for thee where'er our chains fall is cast glad when thy gracious smile we see blessed when our faith can hold thee fast 
O Jesus, ever with us stay. Make all our moments calm and bright. Chase the dark night of sin away. Shed o'er the world thy holy light. Wrong. I'd like to read this morning a passage from John 14, starting in chapter 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is just one of many places that Christ promised us a home in heaven with him and the heavenly father if we'll do our will. But to fulfill his promise, we should look back and look at the sacrifice that he had to go through for us. Just take for a minute and think about the pain and agony. Laid down on that wooden cross, nails driven through both hands, both feet. The tearing of the flesh in agony when that cross was stood up and dropped in that hole and all that weight came down. This is what he endured. He endured this for his love for us. There's nothing we can do to return that love completely. All we can do is follow his teachings and to continue just to say thank you for what he endured for us. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thee now. We pray that we'll always remember the sacrifice, the pain, the suffering, the humiliation that went through so we might have that hope of joining you and the Father in heaven someday, dear Lord. This time we'd like to bless, bless this bread. May we take of it in a way that's pleasing to you. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Let us bless the cup. Lord, once again, we come to you asking your blessings, your mercies, thanking you for what you endured for us, Lord. We thank you for your death on the cross, the pain, the suffering. Dear Lord, we know that you went through this and suffered all for us. Dear Lord, we'd like to bless this cup now that represents the fruit on the vine and your blood that was shed on that cross. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Uh, this time is a time that the elders have set aside, that we have the opportunity to give back 
from what we have been blessed with. We pray that this money will always be used in a way to further the gospel, to further your word and, and the work of the church. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious day. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, Lord. We pray that we'll look around every day and see those that are less fortunate than us, that we may help them, encourage them, Lord. We pray for the ones throughout the world that, that have basically nothing compared to our gifts, Lord. We pray that we'll always be thankful for you, for all we have. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you're using a book and want to mark the invitation after Adam's lesson this morning, it's 132. 132, Does Jesus Care? And we'll sing this song. Pay uh, particular attention to verse 2. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour. Stay Thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when Thou art nigh. I need Thee. Oh, Every hour I need thee, oh bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. I need thee every hour in joy or pain, come quickly and abide. For life is vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Most holy one, oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. 
I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. This morning's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Good morning. Trying to figure this thing out because it wasn't wanting to come on for me. I messed with the batteries a little bit and now it's showing it's kind of a lower battery. Um, Could someone step into that office and grab me another pack? Uh, It should be right there. I just don't want to go out in the middle of this. So, (laughs) While he's grabbing that, let's sing a little song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. When I am weak, He is strong. What we find throughout the scriptures about Jesus was that every single time He was offered a temptation, He refused. He refused to yield to that temptation, and he overcame that temptation with great faithfulness. In fact, it says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 that he was tempted in every respect, just like we are, yet without sin. Can you imagine a whole life of not yielding into temptation? Can you imagine even going a couple days without sinning? For me, that is very hard to even think about it. But Jesus, when He had an opportunity to feel some type of selfishness, some type of ungodly pleasure, to have one moment of pride, He did not yield to it. He refused it. He overcame that temptation. And He did that to be our perfect, unblemished Lamb of God. We read about in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19 where where Jesus, His blood, His pure and perfect sacrifice, His blood cleanses us from all our sins. Jesus had to live a perfect life 
to die for our sins so that we could have eternal life with God. For Jesus, it was a do-or-die moment every single time temptation came up to Him. If he, He overcame that temptation, then His mission continued, and we still had the hope of eternal life. However, if He yielded just to one, just one temptation, if He had one sin, He could not be that perfect sacrifice for us. Isn't it amazing that Jesus went His whole life without sinning? And the fact, too, that that he went his whole life knowing that every time he chose God over himself, that really he was choosing to stay on that path, to die on a cruel, cruel tree for you and for me. That every time he, he, he overcame that sin, it led him closer to the cross to die that excruciating and shameful death for our sins. What an amazing, matchless love that Jesus has for us. Yes, Jesus loves me. But Jesus did not only keep himself from sinning, but he also gave himself as an example to us to keep us from sinning. We see that in our text this morning from Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus is is baptized and immediately He is carried by the Spirit and led by the Spirit into temptation. Now, I know a lot of times when we think about this idea of being Spirit-led, sometimes we have kind of these goosebumps. We have this this, uh, emotional response that this is something to rejoice in, to be exciting about. But here... Jesus was led by the Spirit into a place that was very difficult, into a period of temptation, a period of trials. And here we see as He is led into the wilderness, He fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Now just those two things alone, wilderness and 40, when you put those together, for us who are Bible students, our minds should go right back to the Old Testament. So go back to the, wander, the, the wilderness wanderings of the Israelites. When they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, after they had been freed from Egyptian captivity, they were in the wilderness for 40 years before they went into this promised land, before they went into this land f- flowing with milk and honey. And we find, if we look into the, the Old Testament account, of this wilderness wanderings that the the, the people of Israel, they were tempted too, but they failed miserably many, many times. A lot of times they grumbled at God's lack of provision, at least that's what they thought. Many times they rebelled against God and and His servant Moses. Many times they they set up idols to worship and, and gave themselves to idolatry. Many times... They chose fear over trust in God. In fact, that's why they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, was because they refused to trust God that they could go into Canaan's land and they could take over the land from the people who lived there. And so here, as we think about Jesus going into this wilderness, we're almost expecting Jesus to be like the Israelites, But instead what we find is is that Jesus was able to do what the Israelites could not do. And that is to endure temptation without sin. And what he shows us is, is an example to say, this is how it looks. This is how you are able to overcome temptation when you face it. This is how you do it. Especially when you are weak and vulnerable. See, the thing is about being in the wilderness is is it it, it pushed Jesus to a very vulnerable state. Being in the wilderness, you can imagine the the harsh conditions. You can imagine the lack of food and the lack of water. And in addition to that, we find that Jesus wasn't just out there in the wilderness, but He was alone. He was alone. We've probably heard the phrase before, we're stronger in numbers. See, God in His his endless wisdom decided to help us through this Christian life, to help us overcome temptation by putting us into a body called the church. 
He gave us each other so that we could face temptation head on and overcome together. But Jesus here is alone. He's in harsh conditions and He's hungry. He's in a weak spot. And I think that should be a sign to us that whenever we're in a weak spot, we need to be sure that we're on guard against Satan and his evil schemes. That we make sure we understand that that when we are in that moment of weakness, that Satan is right there trying to tempt us, to make us stumble, to make us sin. But here what we find with Jesus is He overcame the difficulties of the flesh. He overcame the the vulnerable state that He was in. And He overcame Satan and these temptations that He faced. In weakness, in his weak state, Jesus stayed strong. And he stayed strong because he loves you. Because he wants to be that perfect sacrifice for you and for me. And by staying strong, he gives us this great example of how we can become and remain strong even when we are in those weak moments. Even when we are vulnerable to Satan and his attacks. I think the first thing we we see with Jesus and how He shows us by His example how to overcome and stay strong during temptation is that we can overcome temptation even when we're weak when we know the Word of God. You probably know that in the Scriptures the the, the three temptations that, that Satan give to Jesus, that Jesus each time responds By quoting Scripture. He's quoting Scripture. In fact, he's only quoting out of one book of the Old Testament. The book of Deuteronomy. Which is appropriate because that was the the sermon that, that Moses gave as he looked back on the wilderness wanderings and as he looked forward into faithfulness in the promised land. And here Jesus, it seems, is, is meditating on what, what the failures of the people of Israel. He's, he's looking at how they stumbled as Satan comes to him. And as Satan comes to him, he quoted Scripture. Now, think for a second. What is required for you to quote Scripture? Well, you have to memorize Scripture. You have to know it well enough to be able to use it on the spot. You can't, and I can't imagine this happening, but imagine Jesus just taking these big scrolls of the Old Testament into the wilderness, and whenever Satan proposes something to to violate God's will, that, that he grabbed one scroll and he was like, hold on just a second, Satan, let me figure this out. And he's kind of scrolling through, and uh, did you get that? He's scrolling through scrolls. He's scrolling through, and and he's looking to be able to tell Satan something from the Scriptures. That, 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 That didn't happen, right? He had to know it right there on the spot. And for us, we need to use the Scripture and and a deep knowledge of the Scripture to fight against sin and temptation in our lives. In Psalm 119 and verse 11, what we find is that the psalmist says, I've hidden your word in my heart. Why? So that I may not sin against you. We hide the Word of God in our heart. We memorize it. We know it so well. We have a deep understanding of God's Word so that when we need it, we can use it. We can use that sword of the Spirit to defend against sin. And if we don't have that in our heart, what happens is what is, is, is seen and portrayed in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says, My people, my people are destroyed because of lack of of knowledge. They didn't know God. They didn't know His Word. And because of that, they were destroyed for it. They were judged because they did not know the Word of God. And for you and I, we need to know the Word of God. You might think, oh, it's not that, that big of a deal to miss Bible class. It's not, it's not that big of a deal to, to study on my own. I'll leave the studying up to the preacher. Sometimes we we delegate our Bible study, our knowledge of God's Word. 
But really, in the end, we need it on our hearts and in our minds if we stand any chance of fighting the temptation that is all around us. Let us not, let us not denigrate the study of the Bible. Let's lift it up. Let's put it in our hearts so that we have a fighting chance against Satan. However, let me clarify when we talk about knowing Scripture. It's it's not just about having verses memorized. It's not just about knowing a lot of Bible facts so you can win at Bible trivia. There's a lot more to it than that. And we see that here in, in the temptations of Jesus, specifically in the second temptation of Jesus. And that is that Jesus not only knew the Scriptures, but he knew how to apply them accurately. There in Matthew 4 and verse 6, we see that that Satan takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple. And he tells them to to jump off. And and then he quotes Scripture. He quotes from Psalm 91 and says, Hey, you've got divine protection. And we see that here in the Scriptures. So you should be able to throw yourself off. The angels will rescue you. You'll be fine. But in response to that, Jesus says in verse 7, you shall not test the Lord your God. See, he he realized, Jesus realized that, that the application that Satan wanted was not the godly application. It was not what God wanted in the end. And that's important for us to, to realize is that Jesus was using Scripture to interpret Scripture. That's how well we have to know the Scripture, is that that we can't just take something out of context and try to apply it to our life and assume that's good with God. But we need to see the whole of Scripture and to take Scripture and apply it accurately in our life. Because the fact of the matter is, is we can make the Bible say whatever we want it to say, and a lot of people have. You've probably heard the story before, maybe you've heard it from me, where where someone once was at a crossroads in life, and he decided, I'm just going to flip through my Bible, put my finger down, and whatever I put my finger down, I'm going to obey. And so he did that, he flipped through, he put his finger down, looked down, and it said, and Judas hanged himself. Ouch, that's a, a hard one to start with. He says, I'll try again. He flips through, and he puts it down, and he looks again, and it says... Go and do likewise. Double ouch. Then he flips through again, and he does it again, and he looks down and it says, what you're about to do, do it quickly. Now obviously, obviously that is not what God wants. But that's just an example to show you how anyone can take something out of Scripture and say, hey, I'm following the Bible, when they really aren't. We have to make sure that we use the Word of God accurately. Paul says to Timothy to rightly divide the Word of truth. We have to make sure that what we're doing when we come to Scripture, that we're applying it in such a way that honors God, even if there is personal cost to us. Really, when you think about Jesus being up on the pinnacle of the temple, probably the most populated place in all of Palestine, By him throwing himself off and and angels catching him, certainly someone would believe that he was the Messiah by that, right? And maybe the, the thought process was by Satan, if he did that, then he would avoid the cross, he'd avoid all the suffering, all the shame, and he can just show people by doing this, this amazing act. And he really is God's son. But you can do this amazing act and you can skip all the hardship. But Jesus here, he refused. He refused to yield to Satan. Even though it might have been easier for him, he chose what was right. And for us, when we come to Scripture, we need to make sure that we're not using the Scripture just to fit our own lives, to make us feel comfortable to make us feel all warm and fuzzy inside. But we are choosing to obey the Bible even when it's hard, even when it involves sacrifice, even if it means giving of ourself to the Lord in a way that, that we're uncomfortable doing it. And so we need to make sure to interpret Scripture even if it doesn't fit our lives, even if it hurts our lives. And that's what Jesus did. Third, as we think about Jesus, the great model to overcome temptation, 
and believe what we see in these temptations is that even when we're in a weak state, we can remain strong because we know we can resist. We can resist the devil. There's no situation where we can say, well, the devil, the devil he made me do it. We can't say that. He's just a solicitor. He's just the one that presents that temptation in front of us. It's our choice to give in to it or not. Sometimes we give Satan too much credit. He is powerful for sure, but he's not that powerful. And what we find with Jesus is he was able to resist the devil three times, and it says in chapter 4 of Luke, the devil left. There in chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Jesus resisted the devil. He went away, not for good, but at least went away for the time being, for him to regain his strength in a vulnerable and weak time. And you might look at that and say, well, how was Jesus? He was able to resist the devil, but, but you just don't know my situation. You don't know how hard it is for me to live a Christian life. You, you just don't know how hard it is for me to resist the devil. Well, we actually have a promise in James chapter 4 and verse 7 that says this, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Do you hear that beautiful promise? That if we submit ourselves to God and resist the devil, he will flee from us. It's a guarantee. It's a promise of God that we can resist the devil and he will flee, at least for a moment from us, to regain our strength and be able to withstand his assaults again. We need to make sure we understand, unlike what Star Trek says, that resistance is not futile, okay? Some of you older people get that, okay? <laughs> we can resist. And what we find here is that if we resist, the devil will flee from us. And a big part of that is the divine help that we get from God in the midst of temptation. See, we can be strong even in temptation, even when we're weak, when we realize that we are never alone. Isaiah 41 and verse 10 says this, Isaiah 41 and verse 10 it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. God speaking to his people saying, I'm going to give you strength. That even when you're weak, I'm going to be with you. Jesus said it very similarly in, in Matthew 28 and verse 20 where he says, Lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age. The Lord is with us when we're weak, when we're subject to temptation. And part of that, part of the reason for that is because Jesus was willing to go through temptation himself. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Here, Jesus suffered while being tempted. He suffered. He suffered his life to overcome Satan and his schemes. He suffered ultimately to die on the cross for our sins. It would have been easy for him to revile back and, and, and to uh, uh, eventually get vengeance on, his, and on those people who were killing him right there on the spot. It would have been easy for him to do that. But he overcame that temptation to die for us. And because he died, because he was buried and raised again, because he is now ascended to the right hand of the throne of God, because of that, we know that we are never, never alone. That He is there helping us. He knows what we're going through. And He cares. He cares for us. In fact, he, uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 says there that, that Jesus, He lives always to make intercession for His people. God is hearing prayers from Jesus constantly 
on our behalf. Wouldn't you love to hear how Jesus is interceding for you this moment? How He's praying for you in your weakness. How He's praying that you might overcome. We see that in Jesus' life in Luke 23 where He tells Peter, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that, that, that Satan would not sift you like wheat. Constantly, Jesus is praying for us. He's going before the Father, and the Father who has all power is helping us in our time of need if we just, if we just depend on Him. Yes, we might be weak so many times, but we need to realize that He is strong. But in order for us to overcome those temptations that, that we get and stay, to stay strong, even when we might be weak physically or, or drained mentally or, or just tired, we have to use the resources that God has given us. We have to use His Holy Scriptures, that sword of the Spirit, to fight against temptation and to use them accurately. We need to, to use the confidence that comes with that promise, that guarantee that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. What we've got to do is lean and submit on God in all things. Allow him to help us in our time of need. And when we do that, even when we might be weak, we can be strong. We can overcome. We can overcome the devil. And we can stay faithful to our Lord if we just use the resources that He has given us, if we just follow Jesus' example and be faithful in all things. Are you weak this morning? Maybe there's something going on in your life. I don't know. Maybe some family problems. Maybe some, some problems at work. Maybe you're dealing with a health situation. Maybe you just feel off. Whatever it might be, whatever weakness that you might be facing, let me encourage you to remember that even when you are weak, that is not the nail in your coffin. It doesn't mean that you are automatically going to yield to temptation. No, instead, even when we're weak, we can be strong with the help of God. And He helps us because He loves you. He loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. That when we are weak, He is strong. And He will help us overcome whatever we face in this life. Let's pray together. Dear God, our Father, we are so grateful that not only did Jesus die for us as that perfect Lamb that, that never sinned, but also that we have this great example of how we can keep from sinning ourselves, how we can overcome, how we can resist the devil, how we can stay faithful to you. Help us to realize, Lord, that even when we're in these weak states, that we're not a hopeless case, that we have a lot of power on our side. We have your provision and your resources that can help us to overcome. We just pray, Lord, that you'll give us the mind to overcome. That you'll give us the mind to say, I, I'm not going to yield to temptation. I know it's tempting. I know it, it's what I desire, but I'm going to yield to you. I'm going to yield to your word. I'm going to yield to your promises. I'm going to yield to, to your love and your aid and help in my life. Help us, Lord, in the heat of the moment to stay strong through the strength that you give us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe there's someone here this morning that needs to respond to this great message that Jesus, yes, He loves you. And you want to come to Christ and, and to be baptized into Christ, to be united with His death, and to rise to walk a new life with God forever. Or maybe there's someone this morning that's, that's feeling weak. Like I said before, there's strength in numbers. Let's use the resources that God has given us through this church, through His Word, through His promises to overcome these vulnerable and difficult times. And, and if you just want to ask for the prayers of the congregation, there's no judgment that's going to be passed, except that we're all sinners, we're all weak at times, and we just need the help of God 
and the help of God's people. If you have any need, please come forward as we stand and sing this invitation song. As the burdens press, and the cares distress, and the way grows weary and long. Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares, his heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation strong? When for my deep grief I find no relief, though my tears flow all the night long. Oh, yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth? to me and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks is it aught to him does he see oh yes he cares i know he cares his heart is touched with my grief when the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Amen. Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> I'm going to sing a couple of verses of this song, and then we'll be led in our final prayer today. Just a, uh, a quick note, this coming Wednesday night... Uh, in the class that I'll be leading, we're going to take this situation of Jesus' temptation and expand on it a little bit. And I would ask you to read those uh, verses that are listed in the commentary. If you don't have one, uh, you saw Matthew 4, Mark's pretty early, Mark 2, I think, and, and I think Luke chapter 4 also. Just read through those twice. Read through it once rather quickly to refresh your, your memory, and then read through it again and... Uh, try to feel what that must have been like. Uh, I know we can't, but we can try and, and gain something from Jesus' example. So be thinking about that, and then we'll talk about it uh, Wednesday night. Um, 611. Oh, okay. We'll sing two verses, and then we'll be dismissed this morning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, Oh, how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh, how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh, how sweet hope of earth 
and joy of heaven. Would you pray with me? Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you again for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with to come here to worship you. And Father, we thank you for this time we have to study your word, to look deeply at the life of Christ. Father, as we go through this year, it, it's a great study, We're gathering much from it. We pray, Father, that as we study, learn more of Christ, we can be like him where people can see him living in us. And Father, at this time, we've got things on our heart. We have members that are about to undergo uh, treatments for cancer, Father, and uh, we we pray for them. We ask you to be with Carl and Pauletta as they <clears throat> uh, prepare, and we ask you to be with their families, the doctors, Father, if it be your will. Uh, remove this from them. We thank you, Father, for all <clears throat> that you bless us with, for we know all we have comes from thee. And Father, too, we are, we're mindful of a young couple that is getting ready to start a life together. And we ask you to be with Brooke and Michael. And Father, we pray that They'll always look to your word for guidance in their life. And we ask you to bless them, Father, and be with them through their life. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings and all the prayers that you've answered, Father. We know your word is true, and we believe everything that we, we that you say, and Father, we know your will will be done, and we will accept it. Father, be with us. Bring us back tonight as we study more on your word. And this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> 